Okay, so now if we take a look here, here's an example of a cash receipts process. A uh, flow chart showing it, and we see the different departments and functions that are involved. Um, and so, you know, we see um, some of the important controls here. And again, this is a flow chart, so it's an example of a given firm situation, right? And so, what do we have? We have some things like. Um, Obviously, cash is coming from the customer. So you have a sales department that's actually preparing a receipt. Um, and you have a couple copies. One going to the customer, which, you know, if you've ever been you've gone through a drive through and they'll say, hey, if you didn't get a receipt, make sure you call this number. Um, and the reason they're doing that, especially they do, they'll say that for like a, a late night shift, is because... Um, they want to make sure that everyone is giving out receipts uh, because if you don't give a receipt then what can happen is someone could take your cash right if you're the customer the uh, an employee could take the cash give you the product but never actually record it and so that's why you see those signs that are saying if you didn't get a receipt call us because they want they want to make sure that um, everyone uh, is getting a receipt because they want to make sure everything is recorded right uh, another thing they have here is that you have the cash going to um, the bank deposit process that's done by one person and then you have accounts receivable that's actually um, going to enter in the the data into uh, uh, their system and so you want those separated right it's a good segregation of duties control um, you also have this um, process to create a control listing uh, if you're getting in uh, checks as well, and so in this case we have a mailroom now that's in charge of doing that. Um, and again, checks are going to be deposited, um, and the uh, control listing, if you notice, one copy of that control listing is going to go um, to be prepared in, uh, let's see if I can make it go, oh, one second. Um, to uh, this process right here um, and so they're, they have this other department that is basically getting deposit slips from the bank so they're making deposits on the other side um, and then they have a group that's actually validating deposits comparing it against that control listing uh, to make sure, especially for the checks, that those checks were all deposited and no one has taken those, right? In this case, they also have a this centralized data processing um, uh, department, and so all the input is going into this cash receipts program, and then uh, it's actually updating the general ledger directly. Um, and then, again, part of the process uh, is making those control totals, make sure that they're matching um, with uh, what was supposed to be deposited with what actually was deposited, right? Um, and then they're looking for any discrepancy. So again, this is an example of a of a process. Also notice there's a reconciliation. So they kind of have two reconciliations. One is kind of this deposit slip. So that's for each transaction. And then they're also doing kind of a, a bigger batch process of reconciling the bank statement to the general ledger so this is going to be happening usually monthly oops let's see if I can write so that bank rec usually happens once a month it could potentially happen more frequently but historically it's always been once a month uh, this deposit slip verification though that's going to be happening on, on a daily um, or at least a more frequent basis uh, and so you don't want to wait a whole month to find problems if you can right so you, you're having this that's happening more frequently and then this periodic bank rec um, as well now if we look at the a cash disbursements process and so here this flow chart is a little bit um, abbreviated in the sense of it's just focused on the cash dispersions piece so we got a purchase order here we don't really see in this flow chart all that goes into creating the purchase order same thing for the receiving report 
we don't see what goes into creating the receiving report because um, we're just focused on the cash disbursement piece. And so from that perspective, um, then we're going to have these three pieces of information, right? The purchase order, receiving report, and the vendor invoice. Um, we're doing this three-way match, right? Let's, let me see if I can make this line a little bit thinner. Um, so this is the three-way match. <laughs> wow, sorry. That's bad. Uh, that's happening right here, right? Is matching the purchase order receiving report and the vendor invoice. Again, the purchase order, we can see the um, prices that should be on the invoice. The receiving report tells us the quantity of the items that were received and make sure that's what the vendor is actually billing us for. And so we're doing that match prior to doing to setting up an account payable, right? We want to make sure all those all those um, uh, are validated and then uh, once that occurs then uh, that's in, input into a, a voucher program and so you get uh, a purchase transaction file a vouchers payable file and then a cash disbursements file once the um, process occurs where it's actually paid right so what's going to happen here is that um, and by the way vouchers payable vouchers just like an account payable but it's set up by vendor so you could have multiple invoices for one vendor that would show up on one voucher right so it's just a way of like trying to reduce the number of times that that the company has to pay their vendor okay but in terms of the cash disbursements piece that accounts payable gets set up or that voucher gets set up with the due date based on if there's any um, terms, you know, uh, payment terms like 210 net 30 or something like that, then it's scheduled to be paid and then that program is going to then decide, okay, now it's time to go ahead and um, create checks, for example, or, you know, EFT or, um, you know, some kind of automated payment. Um, <clears throat> electronic funds transfer is what EFT stands for, right? That's another way to do it. But in this flowchart they're just kind of showing you a more simple manual a little bit more simple manual process um, so it's going to note on any vouchers payable that it okay we we've paid this one that's what the this program is doing um, it's going to record that cash disbursement um, in this case they're keeping separate paper files as well paper paper journals um, more more often than not what's in typical company is once you have this purchase transaction file or cash disbursements file those basically serve as your journals right they're just they just kind of have a kind of a redundant system in this example again these flowcharts are just an example of how you could control um, the process okay and then finance is um, signing checks right after they reviewed all the information so they're kind of doing that independent verification uh, of the three-way match uh, prior to signing the checks um, and then they're they're mailed to the payees which in this case are are usually vendors if we're talking about vouchers payable okay and again these flowcharts are just examples of given a, a certain level of technology how could you implement internal controls over the process these are things that you probably reviewed in the AIS course um, but it I, f I found it's always good to review uh, internal controls because um, if you don't have a really good understanding of how that should work then it's going to be hard for you to figure out how to actually test it which is what we need to do right obtain understanding and then later we're going to go on and test it so um, this is just some general guidelines we've ar already kind of hit on several of these right don't have just one person handling transactions from beginning to end that's why we had all those different columns right we had the mail room, for example, separate from accounts receivable, um, sales separate from accounts receivable, right? Whoever handles the cash shouldn't also be uh, recorded in the ultimate accounting records. Um, centralized receiving of cash, that was a mail room. Um, off, often what's happening, and there still are some, you know, think about your grandparents, right? They might still be sending in checks for their. Um, uh, some of their uh, um, 
bills that they owe and so they would mail it to an address usually a PO box and that's a lock box and that actually goes to a bank and the bank would actually be kind of a centralized place that receive cash and make and obviously they're really good at, at controlling cash as well um, recording those cash receipts on a timely basis not waiting right um, so you make a deposit it should be recorded uh, quickly um, and then that, I already mentioned that piece about the customers and giving them uh, receipts. Uh, a few more things, um, right? You have to be careful about what you're paying with cash. Um, you want to have a record uh, and cash is easy to um, misuse. Um, and uh, bank wrecks so, uh, are going to be prepared, but we need to make sure that they're not prepared by those that are part of the regular processing of the transaction, right? So if they have custody of cash, you don't want them also reconciling it because they could easily hide it, right? Um, and uh, so we want to make sure that those are, those are separate. And we want to make sure from a control perspective that those are reviewed um, on a regular basis as well. So you may have someone in the controller's office you know like a clerk for example doing a bank rack but then maybe you have the assistant controller reviewing bank reconciliations making sure those reconciliations uh, were done and then were done uh, appropriately um, right that they were documented fully and those kinds of things uh, and then there's ways to use data analytics uh, to monitor cash receipts and disbursements to look to see relative to expectations um, uh, are the cash transactions occurring uh, make sense, right? Um, or do we need to look into it? And so that's from a firm perspective. That would be an internal control that they could use to actually do that. Obviously, as auditors, we could also use data analytics. But this is, again, thinking about it from the firm perspective. What's good internal controls over cash? Okay, so a little bit more here about internal controls for cash receipts. Um, you can see there uh, items related to cash sales. So that would be like point of sale. Um, and then uh, also some items related to receivables. And so collection of receivables. So uh, several of these we've mentioned already. Um, and we'll talk about these more as well once we get to the sales process. Um, uh, we'll also uh, refer to the internal controls here. For segregation of duties, or excuse me, for cash disbursements, um, we've, you know, those different departments that are providing the different functions related to the purchase order and receiving report and the invoice and who sets up the accounts payable who pays the accounts payable, those kinds of things. Um, you know, again, kind of the focus away from paying, you know, we typically don't want to pay in cash if you can help it. Um, you know, some of these other uh, controls, some of which we've already mentioned before um, in the flow chart. So feel free to look at these lists of these two internal control lists for cash receipts and cash disbursement disbursements go back to the flow charts and kind of note where these are occurring uh, just as a refresher again of internal controls uh, so then if we move on to the next learning objective once we've obtained an understanding of the client and the environment we've obtained an understanding of internal controls now we can assess the risk of material misstatement and that's a high learning objective for us it's um, an important one so uh, kind of first step is what could go wrong what are the th one of the issues that we could that a client could have in its uh, um, in this case cash receipts and so obviously there's <clears throat> several different things that could happen I'm not going to go through every single one of these but it might be worth kind of pausing and, and looking at uh, at these I'll, I'll go through just a couple so if we have fictitious cash receipts obviously that's a fraud Basically, you're overstating cash, um, and and so uh, there's one um, way in which you can happen where you're basically transferring cash from one account to another. 
um, without actually recording the transfer. So let's say you're transferring the cash to a personal, um, or not you, but <laughs> but an employee is transferring cash to a personal account, uh, but don't actually record it. That's obviously fraud. Um, what's the internal control weakness that basically is leading to that? And that's a, a problem with segregation of duties, right, in terms of who gets to actual, actually have custody of the cash, in this case, authorizing transfers, and who actually does record keeping, right? Um, and also a, uh, there'd be a problem with the independent verification um, control as well if uh, you don't see a good re bank reconciliation being done to catch this kind of fraud. Um, so uh, failure to record um, receipts from cash sales and I think that's the one I mentioned before and basically the, the fraud version of that is you're intentionally not recording um, those cash receipts and taking the cash yourself um, obviously an error would be some uh, a bookkeeper or, or some kind of clerk omits actually recording the uh, cash receipts right so what are those, the control weaknesses um, you know not having good supervision of a cashier and uh, if you don't have good, um, you know, notices for the customers to set their expectation that they should be getting a receipt, right? Um, and then for the error is not having good controls related to kind of the detection piece on the back end. All right. Um, oh, one thing I want to mention, right? We've got cutoff problems. So you can have situations... Uh, if it's cash receipts, right, when they're saying they're, they want to hold it open, they're basically going to record receipts from next year and bring them into this year, right? So they don't have enough cash on hand that they want to be able to put in the financial statement. So they hold open the, the cash receipts journal, record some more cash receipts, but date them as if they they occurred in the current year. And so fraud, a lot of these frauds, uh, you'll see some things around, right, this is environment, right, this is all control environment, um, right, all these things right here are control environment, uh, board of directors being ineffective, an audit committee, tone at the top, um, undue pressure, all that stuff is related to really any fraud, um, and so, uh, that's going to be a pretty pretty common thing to consider when we're thinking about frauds. Uh, an error related cutoff is um, right. We may not have good information about when the receipt was actually received, right? And so that could be a problem where if they're just not doing it on a timely basis, then um, then that could be what's leading to that error. For cash disbursements, there's another set of potential misstatements along with potential fraud and error examples and the internal control weaknesses that go into it. Um, you know, again, you can definitely spend some time uh, looking through these. There's some nice summary tables or figures here. So let's say you have an inaccurate recording. Um, and so a fraud is a bookkeeper writing the check to themselves. Um, but then record as being issued to someone else, right, like a large vendor, with the hope being that since there's so many checks to the vendor that they would just count it as, oh, that's, we dismissed that one, right? Um, if that's the case, you have a bookkeeper who's also writing a check, that's a segregation of duties problem, right? And so when you're not having a good independent verification later on whoever's supposed to be signing the check, so that would be the internal control weakness. Um, and there'll be others as we go through the cash disbursements process later in more detail when we talk about accounts payable and the purchases process, um, we'll be able to see even more of this. But since it's cash, you know, the cash receipts and cash disbursements relates to the, the cash account.